listening to Make It, a podcast by Bonsai Creative that helps aspiring professionals in film get where they're going faster by dissecting the advice, knowledge, and insights of professional creatives in the film industry. I'm your host, Chris Barkley. My name's Corby Linker. I'm an actor, musician, and author. Uh, you might know me from my current project, Morse Code, um, various things I've appeared at in Nashville and uh, the Southeast. And um, as far as music goes, my latest record, Thousand Springs, and my forthcoming album, Man in the Maroon, and my collection of short stories, Medium Hero. Orby Linker, welcome back to the Make It Podcast. Man, it's great to be here, Chris. Well, it's great to have you for sure. And, and I want to read a little bit more from your bio to get this audience a little bit more acquainted with you. And it is the internet, as I always say. So if anything sounds off or wrong, please feel free to correct me. Uh, Corby Linker is an American folk and Americana singer-songwriter, as well as an author of short stories. He is known for his album, Thousand Springs, and his book of short stories, Medium Hero. The son of a mortician and a school teacher, Linker was born in 1976 in Twin Falls, Idaho, and now resides in Nashville, Tennessee. Linker maintains an active touring schedule. And so speaking of folk and Americana and being known for an album, you have an album coming out right now titled Man in the Maroon. I love that title. What was the inspiration for this album? Well, first of all, I feel like you went to a, a Wikipedia page to get that information. <laughs> Second of all, who writes these things? I mean, I, I, just, I had no hand in this. I, I don't even know where Wikipedia pages come from. And it's very strange to hear one quoted on oneself. Uh, Third of all, it's pretty accurate. So props to you, Wikipedia, they, that that uh, factory of fact checker checkers they got employed there at the Wikipedia headquarters are, <clears throat> are earning their money. Um, Man in the Maroon, is that what you asked me why I made that title? Uh, no, what was the inspiration for the album? But uh, uh -huh. you certainly can answer why that title as well. I'd love to know personally. Well, the, I can tell this interview is going to veer left and right and uh, from the get-go, so... Let's see. I made the, the record. Chris, I started 2020, like all of us, thinking it was normal life. And to that end, I had a couple of irons in different fires, I guess. And one of them was I wanted to accurately document sort of my, my newest batch of songs. I wasn't really thinking about making a record. I just was like, let's record a bunch of what Nashville would call work tapes, you know, um, which are like demos, vo vocal guitar demos. Uh, but I was like, let's make nice recordings of those because I had some people that were interested in my musical career and helping me industry people here now. And so I started doing that. And then the tornado hit. And then two weeks later, uh, the pandemic kind of made us all buckle down, mm -hmm. uh, retreat. And so all of a sudden I had a bunch of time and I was already sort of engaged in this project and it, it took like two seconds to go like, well, what can I do that I can do at home? And it was really, you know, that I had, I made several records at this point, um, in studios and produced a couple of records and feel pretty comfortable um, running the board or, you know, I, I'm comfortable in front of a mic and they say behind the, you know, in front of the camera, behind the camera, in front of the mic, behind the mic analogy doesn't work quite as well. But, um, I am like, I like mixing and I like, I like recording. I like, uh, recording records is kind of a forest more than a trees process. And I've 
mm-hmm. always been better at that. So anyway, um, I just kind of retooled my approach to writing, to creating this collection of recordings and started getting deeper into filling out the productions. And then like, you know, I had a whiteboard and wrote 20 songs that I would record and started doing that. Um, not, not entirely successfully. <laughs> there was a lot of, uh, there was a lot of experiments. Um, I, I feel like April of last year was a time of great freedom that I, that I look back on somewhat fondly, to be honest, because I feel like it was, everybody was just on the same page. Like there was nothing that could happen. Like you're, you're, you weren't going out to meet people. You weren't having coffee. You weren't going to see shows. You weren't playing shows. You weren't doing anything that you would normally, all you were doing was being at your house and doing whatever you could do in your house. Right. And I, I, there was something about that kind of like, it was like free, it was like 35 snow days in a row, you know? Um, and so during that time, I was just like, man, I just recorded all kinds of shit and uh, tried a bunch of things that wasn't sure if it, and I'd, I'd spend whole days, like I would, stuff I would never do now because time is so precious. But then it was a little bit less precious. And I spent whole days like d- doing treatments on songs, like knowing full well it had a small chance of success. And then like listening back, two or three days later and being like, yeah, that's, that's shit next. Um, and also having a Patreon was really helpful to that process because I had, um, a sort of a connected audience throughout all of this. That was not the world at large. Who's, you know, in, in my feeling, just like ready to judge you for your every move. Uh, but rather like, uh, you know, a smaller, a much, much, much smaller subject section of that world of fans uh, who were like excited to hear what I was doing and, or at least, you know, interested. And there was an opportunity there to, I, I, I kind of had an audience in a small way so I could try stuff, post it to those people, see what got a reaction, what didn't um, and move on. And kind of, I was getting feedback the whole time. And so with that, I was also like, I had a lot of like mini deadlines in in a way. So I wasn't just like lost in the, uh, the deep recesses of my creative imagination, all of a sudden like surfacing 65 days later being like, Oh, I have one song. You know, it was like, there were a lot of small, um, interactions that helped kind of keep everything moving, uh, forward. And also like, so I think it just like two, too deep into any one thing because I have that problem if left to my own devices. <laughs> you know, it's funny you mentioned April because I think your favorite singer of all time, Randy Newman, <laughs> had his song Stay Away come out in April as well. And yeah. it's kind of his take on the whole COVID situation. That's funny, man. Yeah. And God, that guy is sarcastic. He is. I thought it was a brilliant little song. And it almost felt um it almost felt like an anti Christmas song in a way coming mm-hmm. out in April, almost like, uh, Joel, Joel, the lump of coal, uh, the killers. <laughs> yeah. Um, which by the way, that song breaks my heart and it's a must listen every, every Christmas, every Christmas. Mm-hmm. I'll, I'll listen to that over jingle bells any day. Oh, for uh, sure. Uh, yeah. So all that feedback you got, and I do, we are going to ask about Patreon a little bit later for sure. We have to touch on that, uh, especially for the filmmakers that listen all that feedback turned into you wanting to create an album out of this. And you've, you've been doing this a while. This is your eighth studio album. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, you're 30 years in the business of being a creative. Let's say 20, 20 years in the business of being a creative. (laughs) Well, I I feel like you've been doing this for so long and I actually, we're going to touch on that too, even before you knew you were doing anything, but I'm curious uh, what you've done differently to promote man in the maroon this time around versus any of your other efforts. Um, man, you ask these tar- hard questions, Chris. Uh, <clears throat> I do not know. Is the <laughs> um, I, 
I had a goal this whole last year was, you know, three fourths of it were creating the creative content that would be man in the room. Um, finished doing that, you know, largely sometime in September, let's say. And then it was like, okay, I've got, I should, I should, you know, finish the whole thing. Like if there's one thing I'm, I kind of have, one of my tiny skills is like, I tend to finish what I start. Um, I'll, I'll see it all the way through. I'm like kind of tenacious like that. And so when I decided whenever that would be, probably was like the end of April, early May that I'm like, okay, this is going to be, I'm going to make a record this year and it's going to be sort of themed around isolation. And, um, and so, you know, I, that I'm, I'm not done with that yet. I, I did finish the record and then I spent the last quarter of 2020 pre-sailing it, let's say to the, to my existing fans and um, to the Patreon, to patron people and, and like that, and sort of raising the money for the mostly just for, to pay for the hard goods that the manufacturing costs um, and pay for the recording itself. And so I've recouped all of that. So that's great. You know, that's one of another life strategy of being a creative. I think in the modern times, is just like keeping your overhead as low as possible. Um, and so now I, I haven't put the record out officially. It's going to come out in April, but there's some question as to which way to go with that. And without getting too far down that path, you know, there's people that have helped me put out records in the past with whom I have maintained positive relations. And so that's an possible outlet for this new project. Mm -hmm. Um, but I'm sort of curious to see what else is out there. It just feels like a wild West right now. Nobody knows what's going on. And whenever there's a, t when in any period of great uncertainty, uh, historically that tends to be good for artists, um, just good for art, let's say. Uh, and so we're definitely in one of those times and, Anyway, there's just like, a, everything's been shook up. So I don't know what's exactly out there. I also have this kind of larger project, uh, that being Morse code that might these, the record and the TV show might help each other in some way. So this is like, these are conversations I've been having like this week. I had a big meeting yesterday, uh, about ways forward with man in the room. This all that all said, it should come out the end of April and um, then it will be done. It's uh, it's, it's interesting because you've created so much material around it. I mean, vinyl, t-shirts, stickers, uh, all this wonderful artwork. And mm -hmm. I'm excited for, for people to see it. I want to do a little housekeeping on an answer you had ago, sure. uh, a, a moment ago, uh, when just as for the audience, uh, when Corby, talked about tornado he was talking about the historic tornado that hit east nashville in the beginning of 2020 which sort of came right after kobe died and then the then the covid hit right after that so it was like this triumphant of terrible uh coming right rough, at us that was a rough month man that was yeah. Brut absolutely brutal. Yeah. And, and, uh, we definitely are going to talk about Morse code. I, I, I love it. And we're it's, again, for the audience, Morse code is a web series that you started in 2018, 19, and, um, uh, are starting back and we're definitely going to get to that, but I want to stick, um, with the album just for a second, one more moment, one more beat, if you will. Um, because full disclosure, I have one of the pre-sale copies. I am one of the loyal Corby Linker fans, and I have listened to this album over and over and over again. Yeah. And you did something pretty bold on this album. You have a near 15-minute spoken story at the end of this album called Mose and Ella. And what does that story mean to you? And, and why did you make that choice? How did you make that choice? Um, yeah, that, that adjective, bold, <clears throat> that's probably, uh, that's how I feel about it. And, uh, not to say like bold, like, woo, man, I'm, I'm the man, this, check this out. More just like, man, I don't know if I should do this, but I just kind of feel like, I just kind of feel like if I didn't, it wouldn't be what the record should be for its time and place in, in my career and in my life right now. Um, 
It's a beautiful story. Well, th- that's, thank you. I wrote, I wrote the story. Okay. Well, a little bit of backstory. I, I write a lot. Um, I'm, a, and I'm, you know, that aside, I'm a pretty dedicated reader and I have been since I was a little kid read every day. Uh, it's just one of the, it's not like a, a boast or anything. It's just like a joy of my life. You know, it's like, one, it's one of my favorite things to do. And it basically always has been. So I have this relationship to, um, literature and the written word that goes back to my earliest years. And, uh, to that end, I started, you know, writing in earnest in my early twenties and in my thirties got good enough at it that somebody decided to publish a book that I wrote a collection of short stories, uh, that was, uh, the aforementioned medium hero. And it's just like, and it's something I do, you know, a lot. Uh, and so one of the things I did this last year was write more stories because I tend to do that. And, um, I'll tell you a little backstory with this one, which was that I, I really have always loved that song moon river Mm -hmm. and, um, which was written for breakfast at Tiffany's, I believe. And was definitely like debuted on that film. That's right. And Audrey, Audrey Hepburn, the actress, not only does she, is that literally like really her voice singing, but she's also playing those guitar chords and they're not like GCD full chords. They're like, they're kind of, they're a little bit expensive, you know, and she's really doing it. I just remember seeing her do that. I was like kind of proud of her. Like, you know, it's like, good job. Anyway, um, we always love that song. And I, for some reason, you know, like we get on these deep dives, you can find out about anything these days. You found out about me for God's sake. <laughs> uh, I got on a deep dive about moon river and it was really written. The lyric was written by, uh, or it was written around the, the, this idea of my huckleberry friend, uh, is it Rogers Hammerstein? I'm so dumb for not knowing this. I had a friend named Jeff that was obsessed with Audrey Hepburn. And every time you went to his house, he had all the posters up and it was an odd thing to see a grown man with Audrey Hepburn posters. <laughs> in his house, but, but he loved her and he loved breakfast club. And that's where I learned everything about it. And I'm a little bit like you, I fell in love with moon river and then Frank ocean remade the song. I mean, it's been remade a ton, but Frank sure. ocean's remake steals your breath. And, oh, yeah. uh, and, and with yours, I, I loved what you did with it. And a lot of it is sort of your singing style. It's this thing you do where, um, the ear wants to hear, the uh, sort of resolving note, but you'll only give it to us vocally halfway and then let the music push in and Mm. give that note. And it's so powerful. Uh, It's such a powerful style that you've polished and honed for yourself. So congrats on, uh, on your version of moon river as well, man. Frankly, I have no idea what you're talking about and that's probably for the best, Um, (laughs) but thank I mean, thank you. And, uh, well, I noticed it, for example, in Tri-State Lottery, which is another one of your songs, great songs on the album. And there's a moment there, there are a couple moments there where you're, there's a refrain where you're headed to Nashville, Tennessee, it says. And instead of enunciating and hitting Tennessee and making your voice hit the resolving note in that chord, you kind of you kind of give us a, a bit of it, a frailty that's beautiful. Mm. That chord hits strong. It's bold. It's round. It's there. Mm. And it kind of gives you goosebumps when it happens and it's great. So a little clarity on what I mean. I um, I apologize. Well, I, well, I appreciate that. And, uh, and thank you for the moon river props because I do love that song. And I, I felt like I wanted it for, you know, that was one this, that song, the recording of that song was part of that April experiment where I was just like, I always love this song. I don't know why I want to, I don't know, whatever. I just like the song. So let me see if I can make something with it. And then I was like, well, I, I want to do something that's, you know, my, the way I would do it. And then I also want to do something that's not been done before. And so I made up a little arrangement for it on uh, baritone ukulele, which I, for some reason in the last two or three years of my life, I just play all the time. I just love baritone uke. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I created this arrangement for it and you know, recorded it. And I sent it to a friend of mine and she, she went back. She's pretty tough. She's kind of an industry person. And she, you know, she's like, yeah, 
you know, I just, I, I like it. Hey, it sounds great. You sing great. Uh, just kind of wish you had done something different with it. And I'm just like, <laughs> I was like actually furious. I don't really surprise, surprise respond super well to criticism. But, um, <clears throat> and so I, I like fumed about that for like three days and I was like, mm, it's original. And so I was like, well, what can I do to make this like, to, like I kind of wanted, there was something, there was a little bit of a vendetta in a certain way, kind of a little messed up in my head, but like, uh, so I was like, I'm going to just write a backstory for Moon River that will blow her mind. Yeah. Or I tried to do that, you know? And so I like <clears throat> wrote what was Mosinella, um, which is really, you know, I, the more we talk, like a, I'll eventually contradict myself. B, um, this is going to go, this conversation may go more towards just like um, abstract creative approaches, but, um, something I'm just really interested in is the tension between, uh, you could say training and inspiration, or you could say, um, practice dedication uh, versus just ecstatic spontaneous eruption mm -hmm. um both of those things are you know I, I kind of have a relationship with both of those approaches to creative work and i'm interested in them and i'm also i'm also interested in questions about proper versus improper whatever that means you know that's like loosest way of putting something and so i, I try to embody those some of those abstract concepts into two characters, which were Moe's and Ella. And I mean, I, I'm going to assume that most people haven't heard this story or anything in the audience, but um, it's basically a story of these two little girls, two friends that are on a walk through the woods and it's getting dark. And one of the friends is kind of, well, she's uptight and sort of worried about what mom and dad think and worried about getting home. And the other friends just sort of just like a free spirit and, uh, you know, it's confident, like it's all going to be okay. And, you know, on some level, those are like two aspects of my personality. I feel both of those things a lot. I mean, I'm like kind of super uptight in a way, mm -hmm. but I don't think that you can get things done if you're not. <laughs> um, and so the, like whatever that thing is in me that likes to finish projects or just likes to push to the next thing or, you know, I tend to, in my like little habit character, uh, I tend to write, you know, a to-do list every single day before I go to bed. And then I schedule it out for my next day because I'm, you know, an entrepreneurial sort. So there's no schedule in my life other than the one I impose on it. So I tend to be very deliberate about that, particularly the night before the day starts, because I noticed after, you know, being alive for long enough that I lose most of my time or I waste time mostly when I'm just trying to decide what to do next. And uh, it's that decision-making time that I feel like is best left to a dedicated period, like a half an hour before you go to bed or whatever, uh, uh, so that you just lay it all out because that's when you kind of your not when you're not actively engaged in the actual decision making or like when there's not a bunch of activity going around, you can sort of tap into that place in yourself. That's like more aligned with larger, with, with longer timeframes and larger goals. And then you can make decisions with those things in mind about how to spend your time. But, you know, in my case, the following day. And so I'll like, lay all of that out so that when I wake up, I don't go like, okay, what should I do? I just wake up and I already know, like, I don't have to make, and then I, I give my, you know, sometimes it's not perfect because sometimes you, you can't know, always know how long things are going to take. And also you, as a creative, you have to give yourself, um, leeway to like get into something deeper if it's going well or whatever. Sometimes things take a long time or that I did not, but anyway, it's like an effort to, uh, lay some structure on an otherwise structureless existence. Okay. So that's like, you know, I, I love that. Well, <clears throat> I mean, whatever, everybody's different. That's something that's sort of worked for me. Uh, and that's embodied in that, you know, one of those characters. And then the other character Mose, is just like, 
she's got she's going somewhere she sort of doesn't make sense but she's sort of lovable she and you kind of i hopefully you know like i try to make the reader feel like she he, he, he or she or he, uh, believes Mose when she says she knows where she's going. And or is there, it's sort of like Mose is like the charismatic person. You know, we all know charismatic people. I'm just like addicted to charismatic people. I love, I love people that are fun to be around. And, uh, you know, I, th- I think that acting is a large part of that. Like, you know, our favorite actors in some level are just people we want to be around. We want to see them do their thing. Because, you know, whether, uh, you know, George Clooney, say, is playing the Matt King and the Descendants or whoever, it's still George Clooney. And you just kind of like want to see him do his thing. Like, he's mm-hmm. just, anyway, so that's such a huge part of creativity. In a, and, um, you know, that's how it's manifested in an actor. But in a musician, it's, it's just Margot Price. Or you just like, you just want to hear her, her take on this song. Um, that's super important and it doesn't even matter like how well you organize your time. I mean, the world is full of people create like people that are my friends that are good time management people that maybe aren't like, you know, I don't know, (laughs) maybe when it comes down to it, the art's not super, super amazing, but it's amazing enough. And they're also then keep it all together and they're running a small business and da, da, da. anyway watch i don't ever want to be that person i would rather just i would rather just wake up at noon and waste a day and come up with six good lines of the song rather than just be like super efficient all the time mm-hmm. uh unfortunately anyway i try to do both i don't how how well i do that is another story okay that's probably enough for one one of those questions <laughs> <laughs> Man, I, uh... No, I love it. I love it. Cause I'm, we're actually getting some jewels of advice. We're getting some methodology behind the madness, if you will, and the creativity. And, but, but you're right. I mean, this story is really about two girls who don't seem uh, to be similar, but clearly need each other quite a bit. Uh, one, one of them, you know, Ella keeps Moe's grounded and Moe's keeps uh, Ella from just staying in her house all day. Mm-hmm. And the conclusion of the story and the thing I love about your writing in general is that it doesn't have to be uh, some terrifying event, some some big event that that's unbelievable. Uh, the things that happen in your stories uh, almost uh, irony is the wrong word, but but it you know sometimes it's the wrong word with your writing. But but they these things come to a conclusion in a beautiful way and, and that and for the audience to understand that, you know, this story comes right before your remake of moon river and where these two end up at is playing uh, a song together, you know, at the banks of, I guess what would be uh, a body of water. And it is really a beautiful transition. And I'm sure that you, your your critic there had to at least bow to the attempt uh, at this because no one has done moon river like this before. Well, I mean, thanks. I'm glad. I mean, really, I'm just, thanks for hanging with the story to to get back to your original question. Like you said, like, Hey, that's kind of a bold move, putting a a 15 minute short story on your, uh, you know, music album. And, uh, yeah, I really hesitated a lot about whether or not to do that because it's just like, it's not going to be everybody's thing. I mean, you know, like obviously, I mean, most of the stuff I do isn't everybody's thing. Most of the stuff everybody does isn't everybody's thing. Uh, but like, and then I was kind of like, well, I don't know. You just skip it. if You don't want to listen to it. And, right. and then it was, it was just kind of, I don't really know what to do with the fact that I, I write songs and sing songs and it's super important to me. And I, you know, I live in this world of music. I, on a daily basis, I'm practicing something or another. Um, I don't know how to square that with this sort of deep love of, of the written word and in terms of doing both. And, um, I'm still figuring it all, it all out, but it seemed like an interesting experiment might be to use the release of an album as an opportunity to share one of those stories and then, you know, I kind of get into it when, as I'm reading it, it's, it's a bit acted. 
in a sense. Um, and so that was it's sort of an opportunity to bring together, you know, three of three of my disciplines, say, uh, in, in an attempt to share something new that that maybe hasn't been done. Yeah, so. it, it would be flat out a great short film um, if, if you ever wanted to make it. But you talk about your writing and it's such an acute point because my observation is that you are this prolific creator where you sing, you write, you act, you produce. Uh, but the center, the core of all your talent is writing. And I'm curious what sparked the need in you to write from maybe a young age. I mean, yeah, I, I think you're, well, first of all, I think you're right on. I mean, at the, to me, my, the heart of what I do is it's all about writing. I love writing. Um, and it all comes out of that. Um, how that got started. I mean, for sure it was because of, you know, really positive early experiences I had with reading. Uh, and, um, my, I mean, I, there's a story I tell at, uh, shows sometimes about how I had this experience with my family when I was maybe, I was probably five or six and we were on family vacation, uh, in Canada. I lived, I grew up in Idaho, a little town in Idaho, and that's close to Canada. So we went up to, to Banff, I think. And in the station wagon, it was me and my mom and my dad and my brother, uh, you know, mom and dad up front, brother, brothers in the back seat. And while my dad drove, my mom read aloud to the family, um, where the red fern grows. She had been reading it for, you know, a couple of weeks probably here and there in different places, not all on family vacation, but she just took the, the book with us when we went. And so she was reading uh, this book as dad drove and it got to the part where it, if you're not familiar with where the red friend grows, it's like the quintessential boy in this dog story. In this mm -hmm. case, two dogs. And it, there's a scene in the end, spoiler alert, where uh, the this mountain lion, they tree this mountain lion and the, er, the, the mountain lion attacks the two dogs and ends up killing one of the dogs. And, um, it's, it's really, I mean, it's sharp writing. It's great storytelling. And my mom's reading it, you know, and she starts like crying. And I was like, Whoa, at first I was like kind of uncomfortable, like, Whoa, mom, dude, get it together. We're just like, on summer vacation, we're just trying to have fun. And then, you know, she kept reading them real quick. All of a sudden I was like, what? Oh, dad. <laughs> and I just start, I start bawling and I'm embarrassed. And I like turn my head out the window so my brothers can see. And then after <laughs> minutes, I like look over and he is just like, Whoa, just like shuddering over. And he's like, he's bawling. And then my dad started crying. He had to pull over the car. And it was like this truly weird moment that, you know, I remember 35 years later where I, I, I was just like words on a page are in, like, can do, can make pe touch people in the center of their hearts, you know, like can, can puncture the human soul. And, uh, and it doesn't have to be like smart or big, or it doesn't have to be, there's nothing about, it's just about telling a story well and telling it true. And I, I, I don't, I've never met Wilson Rawls who wrote that book, but, um, you know, I think that just as in acting, uh, when, with, when, when you see a great performance acting, it's, you're seeing something of that person's soul. You know, that's, that's really the, the true attractor in, in moments like that. And just the same with writing. It's like when I read great writing, I am hanging out with that writer, you know, and like I just finished this book, Angle of Repose and um, Wallace Stegner. He's just like this luminary writer. He's kind of the quintessential writer of the American West. Mm -hmm. He taught the creative writing program at Stanford for like 40 years. He, he's so pu over published. And, um, 
anyway, his, his book, Angle of Repose, won the, won the Pulitzer in like 71, 1971. And uh, I've been a fan of his for a while. I've been reading his book. But anyway, the point is like I'm reading this. That was the last great book I read. I finished it two weeks ago. Um, and hanging out with that book, it's just like you're hanging out with somebody that is just, you know, a lovely person, a lovely soul. And you know that because they're because of what they're writing, what they're sharing of themselves on a page. And that's, that's just been so attractive to me. And there's something about, um, writing is so it's really like one mind to another or one heart to another. People don't talk about hearts anymore, but it's like, um, it's so personal and so intimate and so devoid of anything, but the most essential, you know, I can't, I don't know what Wallace Stegner looked like. Who cares? Just like, I don't know what Jane Austen looked like. It's not important. But when I read pride and prejudice, I'm like, man, she just put something that's so true. And yet in a way that only she could have done. And like anytime I'm around that, I just feel like life is this most amazing thing. <laughs> so I'm very attracted to writing and, and writers and, um, you've read so many books. I'm curious if you had to be on an Island and could only take one book with you, which would it be? That kind of question. <laughs> um, I mean, there's some, I read, I like the great books, you know, I'm like, I don't know when I was in my twenties, I really did like two things. I had this bluegrass band that I booked. I ran, I sort of ran the band. And so I'd like half acidly booked this band. And then I just read the Russian classics. This took like four years or something. I paid like, I had really insanely low rent and I made probably like 600 bucks a month for like four years or something. I didn't even care. And, um, but, uh, it was during that time. I really like, that's the foundation of my, like, those are my, my, uh, literary fathers and mothers, I guess you could say, were, were the, really the Russian, the Russian writers, mostly Dostoevsky. I mean, this sounds super, if I start talking about this, Chris, it's going to start sounding pretty douchey pretty quick. Just so you know, this is <laughs> in book talk, but, uh, um, go ahead, go for it. Man. You know what? Actually, I, here's the, here's a little connect. Um, I had an early opportunity when I was probably 25 or six, I came to Nashville from, um, at that time I was living in Washington state, Bellingham, Washington. Uh, I just graduated from college and wh who, somebody in town in Nashville was interested in something. I can't, whatever. I had an excuse to go. Mm -hmm. I mean, my buddy went and we had a meeting and it was totally dumb. It wasn't worth a plane ticket. It was just dumb. It was like a, you would have, like, I've had a hundred such meetings since then. Um, but I didn't know that it would be like that. But anyway, me and my buddy, I even flew my buddy down to pay him, uh, to do it. And on our, right before we left town, um, we went to Hillsborough village, uh, to Fido. Oh, it was such a cool place. Yep. I and, love Fido. Uh, yeah, no, I love Fido too. But it was like back then it was like everything. Which is, uh, a coffee shop, popular coffee shop in, in, in college central here in Nashville. Totally. It's still here. You know, it's yep. like yeah, 15 years, probably yeah. still cool. Great. Place. Um, but what is no longer there was right across the street was a used bookstore called book man and book woman. And, um, RIP, I bought many, had spent many happy hours in that place and, and remember it well, try to give them a lot of money too. Yep. Uh, and yep. I, but one of the books I wandered in there and I, for whatever reason, <laughs> it sounds so bad. I bought war and peace. Okay. On paperback from Bookman, and i started reading it on the plane and i read it i read it so fast not be, because only because it was just like honestly it was just a page turner it was just such an interesting book and um it's really like the way tolstoy his writing style is very accessible but what's makes what makes him what sets him apart is his ability to encapsulate the the largest ideas into characters that you want to be around. And then, the, okay. What I mean by that is like war and peace. Nobody ever talks about, well, nobody ever talks about war and peace, but when they do, they don't ever mention that war and peace is really Tolstoy's effort to, to discern or discuss whether or not there is such a thing as free will. 
that's the whole premise of the book. And the way that he goes about doing that is he, he puts that question on top of an, a, a historical event, that being the invasion of Moscow by Napoleon in, you know, 1805 or whatever. And um, Napoleon's a character in the book, like the star of Russia is a character in the book, but they're like, my, but they're all minor characters. The major character is just kind of like a small time, uh, a minor, a minor noble or whatever in a uh, Russia. But it's like you follow this adventure and, <clears throat> you know, it, like a lot of times that question of whether or not there's free will uh, is just so far in the background that a hundred pages pass without it being touched on directly. But the whole, what, that's, what's motivating his whole, the whole narrative. And this is like a thousand page investigation of this question in a dramatic way. And that's why it's, you know, a huge accomplishment of world literature, because it's very difficult to uh, get after a, a question of that kind of fundamental magnitude. Do we have free will or do we not? Are we just like determined by fate or aren't we to like really get at that question and then to dramatize it in such a way that you people want to read it? I mean, I'll never write. But that's so amazing. Anyway, I just I'm like I'm such a fan of that kind of attempt um that i just i like i like it and also i spend a lot of time alone and i'm just an introverted person by nature that most of my you know creative uh whatever whatever you know talent i may or may not have is a, a mostly manifest in situations where I can just do my own thing by myself, you know, behind the curtain, then the thing gets done and then the curtain parts and the audience can view what is. Um, right. I'm not like a guy who shreds, like I, I don't improv, I don't improvise great. I mean, I, I do, I can, and I will if I have to, but it's not a strong thing for me. What's strong for me is just to like sit by myself for sometimes hours at a time and kind of daydream and then put together something that, is sort of bad and then edit it 600 times until it's like not as bad. Yeah. I can definitely relate to, uh, (laughs) I can definitely relate to that process. I mean, it sounds uh, almost identical to, to, to what I do, but I do want to touch on that, that uh, nature, the nature, your temperament, the introversion Uh, you're quoted as saying, I do not know how to bring my life into better balance without it negatively affecting my creative output. Or maybe this is just a fear I need to let go of. What do you mean? Uh, You're quoting um, a New Year's resolution, I think, or something that was sort of recent. Also, something I said, I I don't know if you got that from uh, something I wrote very recently or uh, it's... What I'm trying to say, I wrote a bunch of sort of self-evaluation. I wrote a self-evaluation kind of uh, missive last year on New Year's Eve. Exactly. I stayed home on New Year's Eve. I was cleaning my kitchen. I was thinking about what I want to do with my life in the next couple of years. And what am I doing good? What am I doing bad? What can I improve on? And um, one of those things was, you know, I think that earlier in that same list, I said, you know, I have a manic relationship to creativity, uh, which is true. And it's also been super destabilizing to everything else in my life because I've tended to put it above everything. And, you know, like, um, anyway, without getting too far into that, I, it's, it's really had a negative, it's, it's, I paid a price, you know, in my private life for, having that kind of relationship to art, I'll do anything. I'm interested. I'm more interested in the fire than being warmed by the fire. And Mm -hmm. I, I tend to, I've also like tend to get carried away in everything I do. And I get caught up in moments in a moment. And that's that part that, you know, that's a part where Mose embodies in that story. And that's the part that like, any great artist that I, you know, love embodies, you know, it's why I was a fish fan for four years and watched them play. Cause it's like that, that eternal moment, 
you know, and you can make a moment last if you just burn hot enough. And then in, in that burning is a gift, like not everybody gets to burn. Mm -hmm. And so if you start, if you, if you have moments where you're burning, you want to live there because you never feel more alive. I mean, like even talking about it, I have shivers and I've been super fortunate to have, you know, in my own way, many burning moments. And I've also, <laughs> you know, I'm 44 years old. I'm not married. I don't have any kids. And I noticed that. <laughs> so, wow. Good job, Cord. Way to notice. Um, <laughs> uh, and so, like, that's something that I, I guess if I was, if I was like all okay with that, then there would be no problem. But the fact of the matter is, is I sort of do want to have a, I like kids a lot and I'd like to have a couple and I'd like, um, I'd like a family. And, you know, here's another thing too, is that like, obviously I'm not famous or anything, but I've had, I've had some moments in my career that kind of, absolutely kind yeah. of mattered and, you know, like where I got to be the guy and, I, it's so weird, Chris, because like in that moment, when you, you have that triumph, like without exception, it's meant nothing to me, like in, in the very moment of it, you know, it's like, it's all about the work leading up to it. It's all about the work. I love the work and I love, you know, if, if Morse code goes or like, <laughs> it sounds stupid to say, like, I don't care about the fame, but it's like, I, I've done this long enough to know that with every new breakthrough or every new kind of rise in visibility or success, it's just a whole new set of problems. Mm -hmm. So it's just like nothing really changes. Essentially. If you're not happy right now with what you're doing, you're not going to be happy five years from now when you have that show on TV or you have that. It's like, I'm, I'm like stoked most days when I rise, when I get up in the morning, because I'm, I love my work. I, do, I really do. And anyway, I noticed that, uh, when I've like triumphed or come out on top in some kind of <laughs> head to head combat, <laughs> I'm like, it means nothing to me. I like, I'll be, I just remember like I won, I won this prestigious songwriting contest a couple of years ago and I was, it was like in its you know, a TV moment where you're like on a stage and the judges like, they like they invited the top 10 people out of like 500 or whatever to come and each perform their song. And I was one of the 10 and at the end, they line all the 10 people up and then they start from in 10th place. So the, the name and, and then, you know, like as soon as you hear your name, like, okay, cool. I got fifth or whatever. And they just kept not answering, like not saying my name. And then I got up to like three, then two, then, when they said the two, I was like, whoa, I guess it's me. And then they said my name and I'm like, whoa, I guess I won. And I just look it out. And I was like, um, I immediately went to like, well, I mean, that lady's probably going to answer my email now. And uh, so if I can, I can send it <laughs> so I've been, I've been up on the website and um, now, yeah, it would be easier to get that code right when I get back. I mean, I just immediately went to, you know, like the next line of things that I, so at some point you realize that it's true, that, man. It's, it's such validation though. It's, it is super validating. And I don't want to denigrate that at all. Like it was, it's, it was, that was so nice to know that like, Hey, I, maybe I can do this, you know, cause you do need moments like that because otherwise, especially in any create, like in any creative work, you're like, does this even matter? Cause it sort of doesn't, but like, should I be doing this? There's so many things I could be doing, like making money, like my parents want me to, or whoever. And, uh, instead, instead of spending all this time, like on a, like, do I have any talent? Like, you don't know, you don't know unless, you know, like, even if you win something, it still doesn't really mean a ton, but it means something anyway. Uh, that's all to say that's like, I learned, you know, five, six, seven years ago. It's like, you know, I kind of do want to like have a buddy in my life. Like I went, cause I, I noticed that it, in all kind of cool moments that I've had career or otherwise, when I've had a person to like share it with, then it was everything. Cause it was, then it was like our thing. And, uh, that's, that's a very motivating to, for me personally. And like, in terms of trying to create more balance in my life. And I'm like very much in, in that 
experiment right now. Uh, yeah, in fact, I think my, I think my lady just pulled up at my house. So we probably can't talk for much, much longer, but I'm happy to talk more. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Um, I don't think it's any secret to your fans and those that follow you, follow you, that you're a spiritual person. I mean, I wouldn't quite say necessarily, necessarily religious, but you're certainly spiritual and you went to church with your parents as a kid. Uh, but what's interesting is that your dad was a mortician. What, did your dad being a mortician teach you about God? Um, that's a pregnant question there. I, <laughs> yeah, my dad was a really unusual person in, um, in that he was uh, the second oldest of 11 kids born to uh, a, a little, a preacher in a, a town of about 200 people in, in Southern Oregon, a little logging town. So he was like super poor and he, his, his own personality is very different than mine. Um, he was absolutely like, he's an Enneagram too. Uh, just very wants to, wants to do the right thing at all times. And so I grew up in a unusual, unusual situation and that, you know, my folks never drank ever, like not once. And, uh, my dad, that my dad didn't swear. It's just a given stuff like that. And so there was this sort of like, holy, holy vibe around the house. But then there was like, we were sort of outcasts in my community, not outcasts. That's too strong of a word, but definitely on the fringe because I grew up in a, in Southern Idaho, which is predominantly Mormon. And so like all of the kids at school, like especially the affluent people or the cute girls or the smart kids, like everybody was Mormon and we, we weren't. Mm. So that was like a weird way to grow up. I was, I always felt like on the outside a little bit. And, um, and then my dad was a mortician too. So that was, there was a couple of things with that. Like, so he wasn't like, a a snob (laughs) (laughs) um and so like but he was really good at what he did and namely in the the human part of it like he's very sensitive empathetic empathetic type of person and so he was great at that you know crazy scary sometimes grief-stricken moment for families when they lose a loved one and he just he was you know, pro, but also warm. And he was great at what he did. And, uh, you know, there's, I could talk about this way more than this podcast once, but it, it was, what was, what I remember about my childhood more than anything was that he once in a while, like, so my dad was like super faith oriented, you know, but not like in a, you got to, ask Jesus to forgive your sins or you're going to hell. We didn't really get that vibe. It was just more of like a, I don't know, relationship with God to put in a sentence. Um, But the way that manifested, my dad was just like so nice to us. He was such a great dad. And, you know, not to say there was like disciplinary moments or whatever in my childhood, but like the, you know, at the end of the day, I was like, man, dad, dad has got me and dad is a good man. And, and like that. And, uh, but with the, once in a while he would get, you know, a kid would come into the mortuary, like, or a baby. And those moments would be really trying for him, like spiritually. And I didn't know all of this as a kid really was, I didn't put it all together until I was much older, but the way that would manifest with him is he'd write these poems mm. and this is where I got the beginning of my interest in music was because I mean, still, there's a sock drawer in my house where my parents live that's full of my dad's poems. And they're not like highbrow Shakespearean sonnets. They're just like these iambic pentameter, you know, folk poems in a way of a guy trying to understand why, like who God is, you know, like to put it in a really clumsy way. And, you know, in other ways that would manifest would be like for any important family occasion. And that persists to this day. Uh, 
Thanksgiving this happened, like <clears throat> any family gathering or anything like my parents were big in their church. And so like when the church building, you know, moved to across town or whatever, and there was like a little moment, like he would write a poem for the occasion and like get up and share it for, with everybody. And it's just like so sweet and, and tender in a way. And then mm-hmm. like had a little, had a little bit of a, it's sanctified, like it, there's, it added to the sacredness of the moment, you know, as poetry and music it was it's supposed to do so i got that that sort of exposure and then you know being surrounded by death uh which i was my parents didn't like keep it from me or something i mean and it was like honestly it was just like a part of the daily deal like sometimes we would uh, go down and like we were like the mortuary where my dad worked was like right across from city park and so sometimes we'd like go pick up kfc and like Go and pick up, you know, go get my dad. Except he was finishing up with a body, and so we just sit there and hang out in the embalming room. My dad finished up on some, you know, eighty-five-year-old dude. Fascinating. And go across the park, and so this is all to say that, like, I had a very, you know, death was a part of my life from a very young age, and I think it gives. I, I this is something I think about a lot because of you know, with all of the craziness in the world right now, um, I don't. I don't hang with it a whole lot and it's not really because like, I don't want to engage, but it's partly, there's something, I don't want to say it's out of humility because that sounds self aggrandizing, but it's like, there's something about that. It's like, I don't know. And I know really simple things. I know really, really simple things. And that's like the stuff that I was kind of exposed to as a kid. And I'm just, I'm trying hard enough to, to embody some of those, those things that I think they're best expressed without being pointed at directly. That sounds so weird to say, or like mm, fuzzy to say. Mm. And, um, but it's really, there's that proximity to death. I think about death a lot. I think about my own death a lot. I feel like my own death is close, just like all of ours is. And, I mean, close might be 40 years or, or four, I don't know, but it like just knowing that and like it, it steers my daily actions and it also gives me a perspective in my, the little ups and downs that are inevitable with my own life and career. So yeah. nothing, nothing really matters, but like, except how you comport yourself through life, how you treat people, what you put out into the world. That's right. And um, I had uh, Memento Mori engraved on some cocktail glasses that I give guests when we pour a drink, half just as my final pitch to anyone who's like having a dry January, but yeah. also just as a great reminder to sip slowly, enjoy it, and uh, remember that you too must die. Uh, I want to shift gears a little bit into Morse code. Um, I'm so excited about this. This is a web series that you're trying to turn into a 30 minute sort of half hour show. I love the idea of it being sort of like the length of search party and other shows like that, where it's like 21, 22 minutes in and out and something hooks you at the very end and it becomes sort of this viral bingeable watch. Your co-writer is Travis Nicholson, who, uh, is an actor and and writer in his own right. And has also lived the life you're living this life of being a traveling artist, um, going from gig to gig, but also trying to find that balance, which is really what the show is about at its heart. It's, it's a artist who's trying to really make it big, but also has to balance his life, uh, as a father and as an ex-husband and trying to move forward from that. I think it's a perfect, I think you have the perfect co-writer. I think it's a perfect show for, people who can relate to the struggle of being an independent creative or artist in any field. So I want to talk about how is it going? And maybe you could talk a little bit more if I didn't hit it on the head, tell us a little bit more and and the audience a little bit more about what the show is about and how you perceive it changing uh, as you push it onto sort of a Netflix level platform, uh, wherever it, you know, whether it be Netflix or somewhere else, wherever it may land. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, the the origin of this show really just came out of, like, a chance meeting with this then 
eight year old girl named Maggie Schneider. Mm-hmm. I got cast to play uh, a dad, <laughs> a music video in town, and she was cast as my daughter. And um, the day of the shoot, as is often the case, you know, call time was at whatever early, and then we didn't film till late. So we had six hours or something on set to just kill time. And we ended up just hanging out for the, all of that time. I just remember she and her brother, who was also cast in the, in the thing, um, just bringing me um, riddles, just at one after another. Her mom was there. We, we, we all became great friends, but she and I, Maggie and I, we just had this great chemistry. And I was like, I had just come off of the medium hero of the book. And I kind of, I was feeling more confident than I had in the past about my writing chops. And so I was like, you know, I was kind of new to this acting thing. And I was, I should just write a scene for me and Maggie. And so I did, you know, and, uh, and then I thought, well, maybe we should, maybe I should, if I wrote it out a little bit more, it could kind of be open-ended and I could film something. And uh, that was interesting to me too, because I have a little bit of that producer gene. And so I went in location scouting and, you know, this took place over probably two, three, four months, maybe, I don't know, um, before it all came together. And <clears throat> so I'd like cast all the extras and got, you know, some of my super talented friends here in town, Sarah Antonio, and Olivia Turco, uh, Olivia Evans, um, and Maggie. And, uh, <clears throat> and then I was like, my, I have a couple of buddies in the Americana world that are, to my mind, famous to that might, might just be my own mind, but I reached out to them too. And so I just kind of put together a, a bunch of people and then we shot this thing and it ended up being kind of good. You know, I was like, I think these performances are good and I like the story and everybody else who was involved seemed to be proud of it. And so we shot another one. I wrote another one. We shot that. And this, and then I was like back then I was touring a whole bunch. And so I would just put all this stuff together kind of in between tours and it was all, I don't even look back. I'm like, I don't know. How I did all that, but um, it was all super small time and very low, very low budget. And, but I would pay, you know, it was not free and I'd pay for it with the house concert gigs I was doing or whatever. And uh, then I, we, I did four of them and the fourth one was a little too ambitious. It was like six locations and um, it ended up shooting over like five days. And I was just like sick of begging favors from everybody. And, and and I was just like, I was just so exhausted. I was breaking up with my then girlfriend and I like moved out of my own house uh, because I couldn't ask her to leave. And so I just left. I was like sleeping on a friend's couch for, that was like two months, probably. God, I think about that. It's just like, <laughs> <so> <laughs> weird. And um, anyway, at the end of that experience, episode four, my little sister passed away suddenly. And um, it was just like, you know, it's devastating, obviously. And uh, to my family, to me, um, I mean, I still remember when my dad called me. It was like the worst sound you ever want to hear is your father, like who can't form two words together because he's sobbing it was awful. And, uh, I just like that right then just full stop. I'm like, I've got to stop doing this. I don't know what I'm doing with my life. I I need to get out of town. I, I just, I've been doing this for two, uh, like long enough. Like, let's just, anyway, I'd reached out to a friend that I sort of knew who had this ranch out in Montana and was like, can I just go out there for a month or two? And I ended up spending the, the summer out in Montana, just trying to accelerate the story and um, just kind of retooling. And, and during that time, really just, I mean, <clears throat> you know, the, whatever part of me that's spiritual was like, really that part was in overdrive. And I was just ready to let go of whatever and open to what was next and just wanted to do what I was supposed to do. And I didn't care what that was kind of, you know, I had, like I really didn't like I had had fun in music and I've been doing it for 20 years. And, um, I was just open to whatever. And one of those things was really letting go of Morse code. You know, I was like, I was proud of what we did. I, I, I couldn't see the way forward. Um, 
and I was ready to let that go. And so anyway, I came back to Nashville having done that in my head. And the first day I was there, I played this, I, I had came back because I had this showcase at the Americana conference. And so I played that show and this woman came up to me at the end of the show and she was like, you said you had a TV show or something. I was just like, Oh my God. <laughs> like I hadn't even ta- I felt like I hadn't even talked to a, human beings for like three months at that point. You know, I was just like, it was, it was pretty rural. Uh, and it was kind of a shot. Anyway, we started, we, I talked to her and she seemed cool. And, but she like, turns out she'd been, you know, super involved in the film community in town. And she had this legit documentary and Bill Murray was involved and, and she watched the webisodes and she's like, man, I love this. And I really feel like you need to keep going and what do you need? And anyway, she started connecting these dots and, uh, with me and I started like, well, I'm just going to kind of go with whatever energy is coming. So that seems to be the energy that's coming and I'll go with it. And that led to, that's when I met Travis. I met Donna first, Donna Spangler, who's like a line producer in town. And stuff. She's the best. We worked with her on another version of you and she kept, she kept our whole feature together. She's, she's, she's brilliant. She's yeah. The sharpest, sharpest knife in the drawer. Um, and Donna, like, you know, just like everything, I had a meeting with Donna. I didn't even know her. She's just like a friend of Molly's. And Donna was like, she was like, she reached out to Donna. Hey, you should meet Corby. I met her. And it was just like, you know, Donna's pretty, she's like, yeah, okay, cool. Nice to meet you. All right. Well, let's just, you know, keep talking. she's a little bit cool, but, um, mm. but little did I, but we talked and I found that she was like an English major and, you know, her before, film she was a song plugger at ASCAP and I mean she was the song person really and like that there couldn't have been a better fit for me and so I'd like I sent her my my new newest then newest record Thousand Springs and uh Medium Hero the book and she just like turned on a dime just like she just called me up she's like oh man oh, I can't she was just so stoked and I like her energy was what's like changed everything in Morse code. And she introduced me to Travis and we sat down at Brown's diner, a little just dive bar in Nashville. Um, the three of us. And the, I, I have had a few moments like this in my life. Um, I would say like three where I meet somebody and like that, just the physical proximity to them in a room. And I'm just like, this person and I are going to work together or this person, like there is something here. That is just, I know it. It's not like a, it's not a hint. It's just, it's like a command or something. And when I met Trav, I was just like, dude, this guy, he, it was just such a perfect fit for, for the, the world of the show Morse code. Mm-hmm. And, and also for my own kind of personality, because I'm, yeah, I'm funny. I, I don't know if I'm coming across in the interview here, but I'm funny in my way. And uh, <laughs> Travis is like funny, like ha ha funny, like tell jokes at a party fun. But he's yeah. also, he's also, you know, as you know, like he's, he's a really genuine person. He's an earnest person. Yeah. And um, that was so the spirit of the show. And then he like, he took a look at the material and he really loved it. And so one thing led to another and we ended up retooling the five episodes that I had had written, Oh, right before all of that, I decided that I just needed to write the whole season out. So I went back to Montana in January of last year, right before all of the, the world fell apart and wrote the whole, wrote the whole season. I wrote a, like 110 pages of script in 10 days. I just like had a 12 pages a day goal. And then I didn't talk to anybody. I was like literally in a cabin by myself, pretty much bored but there was only right. Anyway, I wrote all of, I wrote a ton of material the whole season for the show, which was incredibly helpful for me personally, because I have now a very strong vision for what is, what, what the show, where the show is headed beyond this first episode. And I believe in it so strongly that it's like, I have kind of unlimited energy in a certain way because I'm just like, this isn't about me. This is about this. This story is so good. Anyway. Um, so (laughs) we, we spent the last, the summer all through COVID, we rewrote this, all the episodes into, you know, a pretty tight 30 page script. 
uh, a really tight 30 page script because we keep sending it to Donna and she'd be like, I don't like this. And I don't like that. And I'd be like, I get super mad quietly. And then like, okay. And then she was always right. And we'd get back together. And anyway, we got to a place where we're like, this thing is slamming. Like we love this and it is ready to shoot. And so right now, I mean, we had a meeting with the two of them yesterday uh, about we're going to, I mean, the shoot date's like April 26th of the week. It's going to be a SAG production. And obviously like there's a heavy price tag attached to that. And we're in earnest securing that money right now. So it's a huge dream of mine and it's super exciting. And it's the kind of thing that's like nothing I could have done by myself you asked me what the show is about. And really it's like you said, it's about a guy like it's a crisis. He's in a crisis of balance. Um, and in this circumstance, it's about the relationship between this independent singer songwriter in Nashville and his 10 year old daughter is really the heart of the relationship. And to the extent that he's succeeding in his career, i.e., touring and meeting people and playing music and having fun, he's not around for his kid. And right in the first episode that is, you know, basically an immediate crisis and it's prompting the dissolution of his marriage. And so all of these things are happening, um, in a very short span. I think that the whole first season is going to take place in two weeks over two weeks. Awesome. Uh, I, I love that. And, um, I can't, I can't wait to, uh, to see what comes out of it, uh, for sure. This is, um, taking it back before what we've seen with the web series, but, you know, I couldn't agree more with, with everyone who's, who's praised it. I, I for the film people out there listening to this, that have done this, that, that they'll, they know as well, your first time out the gate, creating a web series to, to do it as well as you did it is so uncommon. It is so unlikely. And what struck me right away was how good it was for someone who just hadn't done it. And uh, I, that's why uh, I'm so glad you came back to it. It deserves uh, the pathway it's on. It deserves a, a bigger platform and, and a bigger audience. Um, that first season that you did via the web that you're rewriting now in, in uh, the typical sort of episodic format, half hour episodic format, uh, was you know, largely funded via crowdsourcing and Patreon. And we had an interview with um, the co-founder of Paul and Path Entertainment out of Palm Beach, California, Tom Stamager, a couple of weeks ago, maybe a month or two ago, actually. And he was talking about how horrific it was to raise money for a film on Kickstarter. So I'm wondering if you had to be you know, honest in your most honest moment, has it been easy or great to crowdsource funding for projects or has it been not so great? And if it's been great, what, what's different about Patreon versus Kickstarter? Uh, I have two answers for that. One is um, it's, it's mixed blessing because, uh, you know, as a creative, you don't want to be a salesman also. It's, you especially don't want to be a salesman on your own behalf. Right, right. No one I think wants to be that except a different, a salesman, <laughs> a salesman do that, but an artist, uh, not so much. Um, I really, really didn't want to do it the first time I like did a Kickstarter for a record, but then having done it, there were two things that were unmitigated positives. W one was just the pre prep of, of setting up that came that campaign gave me clarity for what I was trying to do personally. So there's just the exercise of communicating to an audience, what you were trying to do helped, you know, and galvanize you for the task ahead. And then the other thing was it just like it built fans because they got excited in advance of your record. And then they just talked about it with each other. Or there was just like this energy where there wouldn't have been if you just like made a record in private and then put it out. Um, right. was, like that said, not a pleasant experience still like with the Kickstarter thing, you know, there's a, a deadline associated with it and you've got to make all your money or you don't make any. So you're stressed. And, but you know, like then the other side of that is that it sort of helps people want to pitch in because they're like, Oh, he's got to make it. And so the last <laughs> 11th hour, you know, I'll send $2,000 more coming, whatever. I think that, 
um, you know, the price point for all endeavors is relative. And for me, the Kickstarter stuff was, was, it made sense for raising the kind of money I needed to raise to put out an independent record. Um, I think that movies, TV shows, I mean, the price tag associated with shooting the pilot for Morse code is to me gobsmacking. Um, Can you share that price tag with the audience? Yeah. To we're raising $250,000 for the SAG show. And um, that's not to say that, you know, you need that to make something quality, um, but we want to do, I already did the super indie version of this. And so I have that, you know, like I, I'm like, I'm really proud of what we pulled off with basically no money. And, um, there's something about, you know, here's, I could talk about this shit for a long time, but like there's a, having no money is a truly beautiful thing. And why it's beautiful is because you know that everybody that's associated with it, that's helping you make your project is there for the love and for no other reason. Mm-hmm. And the second you start making money, all of that changes forever. And it's somewhat, you know, there's still people that want to be involved and are for the love of it, but there's also just like, well, it's going to make me money. Anyway, it's, it, you, it's not to say you should make things for free your whole life. Be like, you shouldn't like, you should want to make, well, whatever. I mean, I want to make things that, um, that can help people raise their families. You know, like I really do. I want to make people money. That's part of a goal of my life. And, um, so the, so yeah, like to me, the, the price tag for the pilot of Morse codes, is pretty high. Um, and I wouldn't do it through Kickstarter. I would never do that through Kickstarter. It would just be kind of silly. It's like, you know, uh, Hey Chris, I'm making this, this TV show. It's going to cost $250,000. Can you help? And you'd be like, man, I love you. I'd love to help. Here's 20 bucks. <laughs> like, that's what I would do for my friends. And so it's just like crowdfunding kind of breaks down at some level, you know, depending on the price tag. I think that if I were trying to raise 10 or, you know, maybe even 20 different story, um, you know, and also like that, you know, I'm trying to do a specific thing. Like when I talk to my buddy, Cody, who's super talented and makes a lot of cool stuff. And I told, you know, told him what I told you, the price tag. He's like, was like mad at me for two days. Um, that's not true. That's sort of, but like, well, the, well, the thing is, is that to get the rebate here in Nashville, you have to spend, I think 250 or 500 no, per it's episode, 200, it's two hundred thousand uh, to get well, the rebate. Well, well, that's for the movies, not for TV. For episodic, mm. it's higher. Mm. Yeah, that's the difference. Yeah, so I, I get where Cody's coming from, but you also have to have a certain budget to even get the the state incentive here. Yeah, that's totally true. And you know, like, there's all kinds of different creatives in the world, um, and I am just very much of the opinion. And this is just, you know, part of my personality. It's like, God damn it. The world is full of money. It's full of bored people who have money It is, or, or talented people who have money or interested people who have tons of money. And what the world is short on is passionate, creative people that can pull shit off. That's right. And that's what I am. And I'm happy to have any conversation with any amount of person, any person. And I'm not like, how do you think all of our favorite directors got to be where they are it's not because they shrank back from a budget or were like i'm not worth that or i'm not worth that they were like i'm fucking worth twice this you know like right. i want to make the best movie i possibly can given whatever you give me and i'm gonna make it slam and then the next one is going to be even better because i'm going to have more money right like, and, and and here's the trick because we I, i'm going to jump in here my apologies because uh I said this over and over on this very podcast is the instinct for filmmakers is to lower the budget and then try to sell their investors on why they're going to make their money back faster because the budget's lower where your real instinct should be to raise the budget, to get professionals, better talent and a bigger upside. If your if your show or movie hits, because the best way to get your next film is by making the people who supported you in your first film or show money. And when you make them money, they want to ride, you know, your good luck. Um, you know, 
you talk about directors, you talk about um, uh, Scorsese, for example, and Spielberg. Well, uh, as it turns out, Spielberg, there's this great story where Spielberg had the rights to Cape Fear and Scorsese had the rights to Schindler's List. Hmm. And uh, their agent decided, no, you guys should actually swap. The question wasn't the money. The question was who should do it because you both are validated as absolute geniuses. So mm-hmm. to your point, once once you're established as someone who can make something that works, you never have to look back from the money department again. No, for, totally true. And, you know, a corollary to that, too, and, and this is a little bit from my own perspective, it's like I don't want to make – I'm not interested in huge box office movies. I don't go to see them. I don't really go see the Marvel movies. I, I don't care. Um, maybe that'll change. Who knows? But, uh, you know, like, <clears throat> I mean, Woody Allen hasn't made a good film in a while, but he's made several in throughout his life. And they've all been pretty low budget films. Mm-hmm. You know, not, they've been, you know, million plus dollar films. But they haven't been $50 million films. And, but he, he made a little bit of money on this. You know, he, somebody gave him a shot on that first film. And they gave him like 2 million bucks or I don't exactly know what it was, but it, you know, it was, a, it was enough to make a real picture and he did it and it made money, not a ton of money, but it made money. And so he got to make another one. And then he's just like made a whole career of that. And I like, yeah, I, it's I totally, a career of making movies about it himself. Yeah, it's uh, a career of doing it, it, what he wanted yeah, to do, you know, right. and like, that's to me everything. Like, I just want to do, I, I, I love my life right now. I have no money, dude. I've, <laughs> and it's like, but I have, I, I wake up every day and I do what I want to do. And I have, I, I'm, I have reason to believe that this may continue because I spend my time, you know, I'm pretty, I'm pretty diligent and I, I live in a passionate universe and I don't, you know, like my, my ambition for Morse code, I'm very ambitious, but I, it's, it's mostly because I have a story I want to tell and I'm passionate about that story. And I don't, I, you know, like what I don't want is to have like a ABC pick it up or something that's never going to happen. But it's like, I would hate that because I, I like they're all of that pressure. And then all of a sudden it's going to be turned into something stupid because it's got to be like for that kind of market. I just want the smallest, coolest show. Uh, I just want enough money to make my thing, do it well, pay everybody what they should get paid and then make another one. Uh, so I'm kind of like saying two different things here. Um, one is just like believe in yourself and ask for the money that it's going to take. Um, and also like, don't ask for six times the money that it's going to take because then you're going to, you're going to be six times on the hook. And you know, there's some kind of, there's some kind of important balance to be struck between expectation of others and creative freedom. And I will always die on the hill of creative freedom. I want as much as possible. I don't want you to tell not you personally, but I don't want people to tell me what to do except for my like core core inner circle of people that are smarter than me and I should, I would do well to involve them into my creative, in my creative enterprises. So. Absolutely. And I think you'll get there because you're passionate, you're two feet in and investors love that. The fact that you wake up every day as an artist and not as anything else. And you do have that humility around what it should be and what it can be. And, and um, you, you very much know what the project is and what it isn't. So I would wish you good luck, but I know you don't need it. You've been so oh, generous I- with your, with <laughs> you've been so generous with your time, Corby. I, I can't thank you enough. These, um, this conversation, uh, like you said, it was going to go left and right, but it was, it was beautiful in the way that it moved. And you mentioned earlier that you were, full steam ahead on on Morse code in 2019. You had the tragedy where your sister died. And I thought a good place to stop would be on that trip to Montana you took to sort of work it all out. And you wrote so much beautiful prose while you were up there that I read every word of that you posted on Facebook and other places. And we got a sense of how you felt. But if you had to think about it right now, what do you want the world to know about Kenna, your sister. I don't think that anybody loved me as much as she did. 
I don't think that anybody believed in me as much as she did. Um, and she had something that I kind of will never have and will always envy, which was, uh, she said what she thought, like unvarnished at all times and you could take it or not. <laughs> and I, um, I really admire her. I, I really admire her, of all her memory for that. Um, because I think the world needs more people that just say what they think instead of saying what they think people want to hear. And we all do that. I mean, like this industry is full of that because you just for having to be nice to everybody, but <clears throat> just, yeah. Thank you so much for that brother. Amen. That um, means the world to, to me and, and I uh, hope somewhere, um, we don't know where, but somewhere I, I hope that that kind of hears those words and, and is smiling down on you. And with that, um, this has been great, man. I, can you tell everybody where they can get a taste of some of this soul emotion that you have uh, on the internet, on social media? Where can they see your work? How can they follow you and support you? Um, well, I'm on Spotify. All the records to date um, are on there. And then I am pretty active on Instagram, Corby Corby. K O R B Y K O R B Y. Um, <laughs> and yeah, I don't know, you know, I'm out there. I do stuff. Follow me and, uh, we'll hang out soon. I can't yeah. wait to do this all in real life. That's right. I think, uh, any cursory sort of Google search of Corby linker K O R B Y L E N K E R, uh, will give you back a ton of hits and results, videos to watch, uh, posts to read, um, uh, web series, books to buy. Uh, so it, there will be no shortage of that. Please, uh, if you're listening to this, go out, support Corby, do those things. Uh, I'll leave you with this, Corby. You once stapled a card on a tree that said, nothing unpredictable ever happens anymore. And then 2020 said, hold my beer. <laughs> <laughs> was there anything about 2020 that was strangely satisfying to you, considering oh. you posted that on a tree? Man, uh, yeah, I fell in love. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> wow. I don't know if you've said that on record yet before, but I love that uh, we got to premiere your your love on the uh, Make It podcast. No, man, I have tons to be grateful for right now. Life is, like, weirdly fantastic. So, And I, I love that because, honestly, most of the creatives I talked to had the exact same sentiment, which was, yeah, it kind of sucks. But at the same time, I've never had such clarity or creative output and things are kind of great right now, but I don't want to say it out loud because I know so many people are hurting, but yeah. I say we're out of 2020, we're on to 2021 and let's say it out loud. Life is great. Let's take care of every moment. Let's take the advice from Corby Linker and wake up enthused to attack each day with purpose and remember the old saying, memento mori, you too must die and so take advantage of every minute corby i love you this has been great i appreciate the time and uh good luck in everything that you're doing man i hope to see you on the outside soon love you too brother let's see it. let's hang soon all right peace peace you've been listening to the make it podcast to find more information about this week's topics including links to relevant blog posts projects and indie creatives please visit our website at www.banzai.film if you haven't already, you can join our podcast community on Apple Podcasts or the podcast app of your choice by searching for Make It Bonsai Creative and the show will pop right up. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at underscore Bonsai Creative and Facebook by searching for Bonsai Creative. And of course, if you're looking to take a big step towards your filmmaking success, go to www.bonsai.film and click on book us to schedule a free discovery meeting and needs assessment. You have everything to gain until next time. Be better, be creative, be engaged, and thank you for listening.